Okay, this video is to introduce the student t distribution. This is a new distribution. Um, usually we, or at least you're used to maybe the standard normal distribution. So the, the student t distribution we use when sigma is unknown. The uh, population standard deviation is unknown, that's sigma. Okay, um, and because there's one more variable that we don't know, we have this type of um, distribution that, as you can see, is still symmetric is still bell shaped. So the student t distribution has the same general shape and symmetry as the standard normal distribution, but it has the greater variability that is expected with small samples. The student t distribution has the same general symmetric bell shape as the standard normal distribution, but has more variability. That's why we use it when sigma is unknown. And then typically with sample sizes that are small. The student t distribution has a mean of zero, but the standard uh, the uh, standard deviation is not one. The standard uh, the standard de deviation of the student t distribution varies with the sample size. So the type of shape that we have here, how high it goes, how wide it goes, it's dependent on sample size. So you can see here, I have a student t distribution with a very small sample size of three in blue. So it's a little bit lower and a little bit wider here. I have the student t distribution with a larger sample size of 12, which is in red, which is a little bit higher than the blue, but a little bit less wide. And then the standard normal, which is in green. Um, and as you can see, and you can read this as the sample size gets larger, it approaches the standard normal distribution. So it approaches that symmetric bell-shaped curve um, that is the standard normal distribution in terms of height and width. But we use this distribution, student t distribution, when sigma is unknown to deal with the variability and um, also when we have small sample sizes, meaning sample size is usually less than 30. <clears throat> now, um, that means because it varies dependent on uh, sample size, we have something called degrees of freedom. That we have to consider df which is based on sample size and we find it by doing n minus 1 n is your sample size so now when you're on a student t distribution you have to consider what we call degrees of freedom so what I want to do is show you how to find critical values um, critical t scores critical values on the student t distribution so We've done it with standard normal distribution, and uh, so now we have to do it with student t distribution. So you're finding these things, t of alpha over 2. So you saw this as z of alpha over 2. This is t of alpha over 2, critical t value corresponding to this area. And usually we find the positive versions so of this area in the right tail. Um, so we're going to start it the same way that we kind of have before, find the critical t-score for a 90% confidence level. Now because I have a 90% confidence level, um, that's going to give me my alpha. 1 minus 0 0.9, so 0 0.10. So confidence level gives me alpha, same thing. Because I want t of alpha over 2, t of 0 0.10 over 2, I want t of 0 0.05. So this part technically doesn't change, doesn't vary. So we're going to, of course, finish this off a little bit differently than how we would if it was a, a critical z score. And what we're going to use is um, table A3. And for, you know, for my students, I'll provide this table in class um, when I see you guys again. So. Notice that um, this table requires degrees of freedom, first of all, which would make sense because if it's a t distribution, then we want degrees of freedom. We have to consider that. And then it also talks about area in one tail, which is this you know, row, and area in two tails, which is this row. Then the body of this table represents our critical t score. So we have to basically find degrees of freedom and either what we call area in one tail or area in two tails, and then match it up to determine our t-score. So 
for this case, um, you know, if I were to draw this curve, and I'm going to try to fit it right here, technically, I'm on a student t distribution, right? This is my t critical value, 0 0.05. Eventually, we don't draw this, but the area here is 0 0.05. Now, this is an area in one tail, in a right tail. We also need degrees of freedom, but our sample size is 20. And degrees of freedom is the sample size minus 1. So I can always determine degrees of freedom based on sample size. So degrees of freedom are 19. So we basically have everything we need to find the critical t-score. We have degrees of freedom, 19, and we have an area in one of our tails, 0 0.05. So let's start with degrees of freedom of 19. So we're going to go to this table, and I have degrees of freedom or 19, that's here. Then my area in one tail, the area in one of these tails is 0 0.05. So my area in one tail is 0 0.05. So now I'm going to line this up. The area in one tail is 0 0.05. The degrees of freedom are 19, and when I line it up, I'm here at... 1.729. That is my critical t-score for this case. 1.729. Okay, and then I'm done. So again, if I'm using table A3, which I use to find critical t-scores, degrees of freedom I need, area in one tail, or area in two tails. For now, your um, confidence intervals, you guys are typically going to use area in one tail. Later on, when you do hypothesis testing, you might see area in two tails. Okay, so let's do these um, other two examples here. Find a critical t-score. For a 95% confidence level and a sample size of 15. Again, we're going to start it the same way that we started this one. It's a 95% confidence level, and our confidence level gives us alpha. Alpha is 1 minus the confidence level, in this case 0 0.05. Um, we're going to do this part exactly the same also. T of alpha over 2 is what I want. T of alpha, which is 0 0.05 over 2. T of 0 0.025. This is very similar to what we did with the um, critical z-score. I also need sample size of 15 degrees of freedom, which is one less than the sample size, so in this case, 14. If you were to draw this curve, you're on a student t distribution curve, you want the critical t-score, which is here, 0 0.025, with an area of 0 0.025 located in the right tail. So I have... Um, degrees of freedom of 14. So we're going to go to table A3 and we're going to look at degrees of freedom of 14 which is here and then we're going to look at the area in one tail is 0 0.025 the area in one tail is 0 0.025 and we're going to line it up here and here 2.145 is my critical t-score 2.145 was it one point? <laughs> what did I say? 2.145. 2.145. And that's it. Okay. Right? So again, alpha over 2 is the area in one tail. Degrees of freedom is one less than the sample size. And we use what we call table A3 to find the critical t score. So let's do one more. Find the critical t score for a 99% confidence level. A um, 99% confidence level going to give me alpha, which is 1 minus 0 0.99, 0 0.01. So T of alpha over 2 is T of 0 0.01 over 2, or T of 0 0.005. This is my area in one tail for a sample size of 28. So my degrees of freedom is one less than that, 27. Okay, I'm going to go to my table. Uh, let me erase what we did before. 
we're going to switch it up. What did I say? Degrees of freedom were 27. Degrees of freedom are 27. Um, area in one tail is 0 0.005. Area in one tail is 0 0.005. Line it up. In this case, 2.771. So my critical T-score for this case, 2.771. Now, um, obviously this table will continue. It does get longer than this. And um, it is somewhat limited depending on the table that you use. This is the table from Triola's book. Um, there are other tables with maybe more critical T-scores. So it all depends on what you're using. But we're using this one. It goes up to 100. If you don't have the degrees of freedom on this table that you need, you're going to have to round to the closest one which means there might be a slight error in your um, your T-score, but it should be close enough. It shouldn't be too bad. Um, if you're using your formula, there'll be a slight error to find your confidence interval from that, but we usually use the calculator anyway. So, um, But again, if you don't have the degrees of freedom directly on this table, then you're just going to have to round to the one that's closest to it on here. Okay.